I want to make some clarifying remarks concerning some of the things that we said last time. To begin with, in James 1, 1, where we talked about to whom the epistle was addressed to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, and we posed two different possibilities. The twelve tribes scattered abroad obviously means all of Israel, not the Jews, not just the Jews. They would be included. The Jews were the first converts. You remember in Acts chapter 2 that 3,000 people were added to the church that day on the that day of Pentecost in 31 A.D. Then the commission had been to preach the gospel, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. In a recent article in the Good News, Dr. Hay writes about the twelve apostles going to various parts around the earth. We've already talked about how that Peter was the apostle to the circumcision. He meant he went mainly to the east. Paul was the apostle to the uncircumcision. He went mainly to the west. There were churches being raised up all over the Mediterranean world. And, of course, we talked about the Jewish dispersions that had taken place. Now, I mentioned five different times in which the Jews went out. Of course, some of them were not scattering from the point of view of being forced to. We talked about Dan, boat, and ships, and that there was some voluntary exploration of the Mediterranean world even before the Exodus and after they got into Palestine. It says Dan continued to uh, dwell in ships. Then, of course, the northern ten tribes going into captivity at the hands of the Assyrians, 721 718 B.C., then the Jews, Benjamin and Judah, going into captivity, 604 to 580s B.C., and then, during the time of Alexander the Great, many Jews voluntarily left the Holy Land and went to other parts of the Mediterranean. In particular, they went down into Egypt, and we talked about they built a temple at Alexandria. And then we mentioned in 63 B.C. that Pompey took many thousands of Jews into captivity, mainly carrying them into Asia Minor, also some into uh, Italy itself. So those are the dispersions. And when James says to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, that's literally what he means in one sense. But yet, on the other hand, when it comes to the application of this epistle in the church, remember I pointed out to you time after time that he uses the word, my brethren. Chapter 1 and verse 2, my brethren counted all joy. Chapter 2, verse 1, my brethren. Chapter 3, verse 1, my brethren. And it's obvious that he's writing to converted people because he even talks about calling the elders of the church when you're sick. Just talking to converted people, and as we've said, the theme of the book is going on to perfection through faith. Now, when we talk about the various sects, S-E-C-T-S, among the Jews, we were showing how they were divided religiously. And the Romans viewed the Jews, I'm sorry, the Romans viewed the early Christians as just another sect of, the, a sect of the Jews early on. But, of course, that eventually changed. Then we talked a little bit about the language, that there were three principal languages during that period of time, Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And I said that the Hebrew that was spoken was also called at times Aramaic. I have here Coney Bear and Housen's book. Coney Bear and Housen is probably the best known commentary on Paul's epistles. And I'm reading on page 29 and footnote 6. 
concerning Aram, A-R-A-M. The highlands of the Semitic tribes comprehended the tract of country which extended from Taurus and Lebanon to Mesopotamia and Arabia. There were two main dialects of Aramean stock, the Eastern or Babylonian, commonly called Chaldee, the Syrian tongue of Second Kings chapter 23 and verse 26, of Isaiah chapter 36 and verse 11, Ezra chapter 4 and verse 7, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 4, and the western, which is the parent of the Syriac, now like the former, almost a dead language, the first of these dialects began to supplant the older Hebrew. In other words, the, the eastern or Babylonian, commonly called Chaldee. So he says the first of these dialects began to supplant the older Hebrew of Judea from the time of the captivity and was the Hebrew of Judea from the time of the captivity, and was the Hebrew of the New Testament. And then he quotes the places in the New Testament where the word Hebrew is used as a language. And of course, in Luke 23 and verse 38, written above the stake in Hebrew, these words, and then the same thing in John 19, verse 20, you have written above the stake in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. And then there are references in Acts of Paul speaking in the Hebrew tongue. Now, in Barclay's commentary, Barclay himself poses the same possibility that I did when James says, I'm writing to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. It may mean literally the twelve physical tribes scattered abroad, but as I pointed out last time, this letter was going to be circulated. It would be sent to the churches, and the churches consisted of Israelite and Gentile together. And so I pose the possibility that the twelve tribes scattered abroad could represent the church. Barclay, in his commentary, poses the same possibility as well. On page 41, the phrase, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, could have a third meaning. To the Christians, the Christian church was the real Israel. At the end of Galatians, Paul sends his blessing to the Israel of God, Galatians 6.16. And last time we turned and read from Galatians 6. The nation Israel had been the had been the specially chosen people of God, but they had refused to accept their place and responsibility in their task. When the Son, Son of God came, they rejected him. Therefore, all the privileges which had once belonged to them passed over to the Christian church, for it was in truth the chosen people of God. And Paul very carefully goes through that in Romans 9, 10, and 11. It was his conviction, that is Paul, that the true descendants of Abraham were not those who could trace their physical descent from him, but those who had made the same venture of faith as he had made. Of course, Paul is the one who really explains that. We've already gone to Galatians 3 at least twice in this class. The true Israel was composed not of any particular nation or race, but of those who accepted Jesus Christ in faith. So then this phrase may well mean the Christian church at large. Now, whether or not it does mean that uh, precisely or not, I don't know for sure, but I do know that the Israel of God today consists of all nations, kindreds, races, tongues. Yet at the same time, that doesn't do away with physical, fleshly Israel and the twelve tribes. We know very clearly from other places in the Bible that the time of Jacob's trouble is coming and the twelve tribes are going to suffer some very serious consequences in the near future, but then after they repent, God is going to have mercy on them and regather them and restore them. But it will be based upon their repentance, faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, 
baptism and laying on of hands before they can fully be restored back in the Holy Land. So I thought I would make those uh, clarifying remarks before we go on. We have come now to James 1-2. And before we go there, let's see if we have any questions from what we've said. Okay, Cliff. Just one, Dr. Ward. I, didn't, I was trying to get down both the two types of Aramaic that they used. They got the Eastern Babylonian called Chaldee. What was the Okay, the other one was the Western dialect. The parent of the Syriac. And as Coney Bear says, it's almost a dead language. Now, of course, in Israel today, they call what they speak Hebrew and uh, these, all of these languages were Semitic languages. They're very similar. Now, Coney Bear goes on to make the statement here that of the Semitic languages, the Arabic language was the most advanced. But whether or not that's true, I cannot defend it one way or the other. Okay, anybody else a question before we go on? All right, in James 1-2... My brethren. Now, one could argue that he's speaking strictly to those who are his brothers according to the flesh, but the contents and the context would not verify that. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different temptations. And the word for temptations in the Greek is pirasmos. And I'll write it on the board as P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S. P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S. Perasmos. And it literally means to try to test with an intended aim in mind. For example, in the commentary of Barclay and what he writes about the word. The word translated temptations is pirasmos, whose meaning we must fully understand if we're to see the very essence of the Christian life. Pirasmos is not temptation in our sense of the term. It is testing, trial, and of course it is rendered such in the Revised Standard Version. How many of you are using the Revised Standard Version of the Bible? So you already have it translated as testing or trial. Pirasmos is trial or tested, testing directed towards an end, and the end is that of one who should emerge stronger and purer from the testing. So it has as its aim to remove the impurities, to purify, to make stronger, and to make purer. So, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different trials. Knowing this, that the trying, and the word for trying here is dokimion, D-O-K-I, M-I-O-N, Dokimion. Dokimion is an interesting word. It is the word for sterling coinage, for money which is genuine and unalloyed. The aim of testing is to purge us of all impurity. We're going to spend considerable time on these two verses because these two verses desperately need to be understood. Those who are in the faith are going to be tried. They're going to be tested. We could go all the way back to Abraham. Abraham was tested time after time after time. And you remember the ultimate test in that he was asked to sacrifice the son of promise, Isaac. And Abraham, without question, knowing 
and believing God, proceeded to do exactly what God had told him to do. Once we have been sanctified and started in this way of life and are called, we're going to be tested, we're going to be tried. And as we go through the process of counseling for baptism, the minister will eventually come to Luke chapter 14 and verse 25 and verse 26 and so on to the end of the chapter in Luke 14. And he will talk about counting the cost. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different trials. Have you counted the cost? I know when we start our baptismal counseling, we are perhaps, unfortunately, more willing to listen than we are at, at other times. We come to the point where we are fed up with the way that we have gone, and we realize that we desperately need God and His Spirit and we begin to really want to turn around, and we fast, we pray, and we come to a state of mind that we say that we're willing to give up everything to follow God. And then the minister will go over this concept of counting the cost. Have you really counted the cost? And so in Luke 14, And there were great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father, his mother, his wife, his children, brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So... At baptism, the minister will go through this, and you'll say, yes, I am willing to give up everything. And I believe at that time we do mean it. And that is our intent. But God does not just take what our intent is. Of course, you've heard the old saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You have to have more than good intentions. You have to then actually crucify self and live the crucified life of faith. And so God is going to allow you to be tested along the way to see if you do place greater affection on anything than you do Him. See, this is the key. Do you place greater affection on anything than you do Him? If any man come to me wanting to be my disciple and love not less his father, his mother, his brother, his sister, Yea, even his own life. He is not worthy to be called my disciple. And so, after baptism, you're going to be tested, you're going to be tried. Obviously, you're tested and tried even before you're baptized. But once you make that commitment, God is going to... No, and know that he knows that you place no greater affection on anything than you do the kingdom of God, on God, on Christ, and being in his family. You know the story that we talk about so often in various points of view in Matthew 19, verse 16, let's turn there, about the rich young ruler who came to Christ. What this story is all about is the fact that, once again, that God asks us to be willing to forsake all to follow him. I'm going to briefly paraphrase the story. This rich young ruler came to Christ and asked him what he had to do to have eternal life. And Christ said, if you would enter into life, keep the commandments. Of course, there was... The part there about why do you call me good master, there's only one good, and that is God. As long as Christ was in the flesh, he had the potential for sin, and flesh cannot be called good. And he says, only my Father in heaven is good. 
So after the young men asked which commandments, Christ enumerated some. Then the young man said, I, I've done this from my youth. I have kept the commandments. And many of you who've grown up in the church, you could say, basically, I have tried to keep the commandments. Perhaps some of you could. Hopefully you could. But there's more involved. He says, if you would enter into life, if you would make the first step, then keep the commandments. And he said he'd done this. But note, there's much more than just keeping the commandments in that sense, especially keeping the commandments rotely. Notice what Jesus said. <clears throat> Verse 20, the young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What do I lack yet? Jesus said unto him, If you will be perfect, go and sell what you have, give to the poor. You shall have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This young man was not even willing to rend his garments, his possessions, much less his heart. So if you're going to actually follow God, you have to come to the point where not only are you willing to rend your garments, but you are willing to rend your heart. And once again, if any man comes to me wanting to be my disciple, love not less, father, mother, brother, sister, yea, even his own life. In other words, you've got to be willing to forsake all. At baptism, you say, that's what I'm willing to do. God takes that at face value at that time, but he is going to test and try you along the way to see if indeed that is what you meant. But in addition to that, it's not only just that. It is for the purpose of driving out the impurities, of coming to see yourself more fully, more completely, and going on to perfection and developing that sterling character of gold. So the trials are definitely going to come. Now, in Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about some of the different trials that we might face and also gives us assurance that if our approach toward God is correct, we will not fail. We will not be separated from the love of God in Christ. In Romans chapter 8, and let's begin in verse 34. Who is he that judges? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So who shall separate you from that commitment you made at baptism? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? All of the various trials that can come in life, are these going to separate you from the love of Christ? Now, oftentimes... Verse 36 is read over, especially when we're trying to come to some great crescendo at the end of the sermon showing that through Jesus Christ that we can conquer all, but there's a key in conquering all, and that's verse 36. The attitude and the frame of mind that is necessary to endure trials, no matter how they come, where they come from outside, persecution, famine, trials that might come to you from the external environment, or whether these trials come upon you in a more direct way. For example, someone accuses you personally of something, or the thing that probably gets people more upset than anything else is for someone in authority to mistreat them. Someone in authority to mistreat you or not give you what you think that you ought to have. And the tendency is for human nature to rise up again, try to get up out of the watery grave where it was buried at baptism and say, I want my way and I'm going to have my way and I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. 
Verse 36, see, gives you the attitude that God wants. He doesn't want you to take things into your hand that way. As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. See, if that's your attitude, then it won't matter what comes along. You will be able to survive spiritually. But if you are going to take it into your own hands, then you won't. Now, in order to have that kind of attitude, you have to be seeking God. You don't automatically have, I'm killed all the day long, I'm counted for sheep as a slaughter, and making yourself that vulnerable. Because we go about normally, naturally, trying to preserve the empirical self. So you've got to be seeking God. You've got to be praying, studying, obeying, occasionally fasting, meditating, drawing near to him. Then you, will, you can have that killed all the day long, counted as sheep for the slaughter attitude, and you won't be thrown when the trials come. Note verse 37. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But the key is verse 36, that we are killed all the day long, accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And in order to maintain that attitude... You've got to seek God and draw close to God continually. And any time that you find yourself in a position where you want to rise up and take things into your own hands, remember this and go back and get close to God and handle it His way. Now, obviously, there is a way for handling the various things that come upon you personally, especially when they come upon you from other people who may offend you or may say bad things about you. We'll be going into that later on in the course. Now I want to be more specific in how does God allow us to be put to the test. Paul named some things here that we have read. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. Most of these things are external things except for the persecution. There are things that have a little bit more meaning in the sense that they are a little bit more subtle and perhaps more difficult to identify. So how does God allow us to be put to the test in addition to these things that Paul enumerates here, and some of the things that he enumerates would fall into these various categories. Okay, one thing that God does in putting us to the test by demanding greater sacrifice, greater sacrifice, more so than the last trial. Abraham's example. After the many trials Abraham had, he is given an even greater trial. He's asked to slaughter his son. The son was a miracle in the first place. Satan tempts for destruction. God allows trials that we might grow, that we might bear fruit. And God is going to uh, continually allow us to be pruned so that we can bear more fruit. Back in John 15, it says, I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So God is going to, from time to time, demand greater sacrifice. Now, I hear people from time to time say, now that I've gone through that, I can go through anything. Be careful, because that is not always 
the case. Now, if you are applying what we've already said, the Romans 8.36, killed all the day long, accounted for a sheep for the slaughter, if you are seeking God and drawing nigh to him continually, then you will be prepared for a greater trial. And like Christ said in John 15.2, that the Father is going to purge every tree that brings forth fruit so that it can bring forth more fruit. And so the, the spiritual life, the Christian life, is never one in which you have arrived and you just coast on into the kingdom of God. You wouldn't want to do that anyhow if you really understand what God is doing. Another way that God allows us to be put to the test is by leading us in a difficult way, a way that doesn't seem to make sense because we're looking at it physically. God occasionally leads us in the difficult way, a way that doesn't make sense if you just look at it physically. And, of course, God wants us to look at the way spiritually instead of physically, to trust him, to believe him, to obey him. The human mind, obviously, first and foremost, sees everything physically through the five senses. And then we have the human mind with the spirit of man whereby we can reason and draw conclusions from our in empirical experiences. But when it comes to spiritual things, God wants us to trust him, believe him, and do what he says. And some of the times uh, he allows us to be led in ways that we don't really understand or comprehend at the time but if we really believe God and trust him, it will work out for the best. Let's notice back in Exodus chapter 13 and verse 17. Exodus 13 and verse 17, the way that God led Israel out of Egypt. It wasn't by the route that you might think. <clears throat> In Exodus 13, verse 17, And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near and was really the easiest route if you just look at it physically. For God said, Lest peradventure the people repent or change their mind when they see war, and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up, harnessed out of the land of Egypt. So you can see very clearly here that God led them in a more difficult way, and it wasn't necessarily, from a physical point of view, the best way. And God will allow you, after you have been baptized, to go out into the wilderness of life. He doesn't just lead you this great, nice, beautiful, wide, green, lush, overflowing with milk and honey path right into the kingdom of God. And he did not lead Israel into, uh, by that kind of path into the promised land. But he led them in a way in which if they were going to survive... They would have to depend upon him. And so he's going to lead us in such a way that if we're going to survive, we're going to have to depend upon him. Another way that God allows us to be put to the test is by giving us the opportunity of choice. He gives us the opportunity of choice. As he said in Deuteronomy chapter 30, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. But he never makes the choice for you. He allows you to make the choice. And one of the simplest statements and most profound statements that I can make is that we are making choices Every day, yea, practically every minute, every hour, 
every day, every week, that will affect us the rest of our lives and even into eternity. The choices that you make each day, they're so vital. And remember 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, that judgment is now upon the house of God. You know, initially when Solomon was allowed to come to the throne, that God appeared to Solomon in a vision, in a dream, and asked him what he wanted. That he could choose anything that he wanted. Solomon at that time chose wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. Of course, unfortunately, Solomon did not continue to make the right choices the rest of his life. You have to continue to make the right choices all of your life. You'll know, how do you know the choices to make? Well, God sets them right before you. He reveals to you through his word the choices that you should make. Your flesh is going to war against these choices. But the choices are set before you very clearly, and you can make them. Another way that God allows us to be put to the test is by posing harder tasks, which may seem impossible. By posing harder tasks that might seem impossible. He does this to prove us, to test us, to try us. Let's give you an example of that in John chapter 6 and verse 5. John chapter 6 and verse 5. Posing harder and more difficult task. In John 6 and verse 5, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove or to try or to test Philip. How am I going to feed this great company or multitude? Where are we going to get bread? Where are we going to buy bread? For he himself knew what he would do. But note verse 7. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. You see, Christ asked him that in verse 6. And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Now, if you were thinking spiritually, and Christ asked you, Where are we going to buy bread for the multitude? What would you say? Well, I know that you have the power to feed all the multitudes of all the earth, physically and spiritually, or spiritually, or physically, whichever one. Okay, another way that God allows us to be tried, God permits men to suffer while doing the work of God. And this really bothers some people. God permits men to suffer while doing the work of God. Paul and Silas were put into prison after having been beaten. But notice what their response was when they were in prison, how they faced the trial. Let's turn there to Acts 16. In no way did Paul or Silas begin to accuse God the way Job did or the way that we often do. We begin to accuse God not in the direct sense, but we begin to reason something like this. We know here these men are giving their very lives to spread the gospel. It would seem that God would put his angels around them and protect them not allow any harm or danger to come to them. But here they are in prison. Why has God allowed this? You won't find in reading the account of Paul's life through the book of Acts or any other place where Paul 
in any way accuse God, or <clears throat> even feeling sorry for himself, or or getting down on life. Notice how he reacted to this in Acts 16, verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, Paul and Silas, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, Everyone's bands were loosed. The keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas. So they didn't feel sorry for themselves. What did James write? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different trials because you can really show God the substance that you're made of, whether or not you're going to trust him and praise him and thank him, or whether or not you're going to go into some kind of state of depression or human reasoning. So it's amazing what God will allow God allows trials on people even when doing his work. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, Paul recounts many of the difficulties that he experienced while doing the work of God. It's incredible as you read through there the, the various things that he went through in doing God's work. We won't read it completely all the way through. In 2 Corinthians 11, in verse 24, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the nations, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, and weariness, and painfulness, and watchings often, and hunger and thirst, and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. You get an idea that God does indeed permit men to suffer while doing the work of God. And you turn back now to Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter four, and notice the attitude or frame of mind that he's trying to get across to the Corinthians. And he always points them back to the big picture. God and Christ are there. God and Christ are not divided. We should be one with God and Christ, each member of the body of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4.11, he says, We have this treasure, the Holy Spirit, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be in God and not of us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of Jesus Christ. In other words... Bearing about in the body the dying of Jesus Christ, they were counted as sheep for the slaughter. They were killed all the day long. They were living sacrifices that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So that's the attitude. Okay, question? Second Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 7, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Okay, another way that God allows us to be tested, God allows 
time and chance to bring about trials. And we shouldn't get superstitious and paranoid about trials and temptations. Sometimes accidents happen that a Christian might be involved in. Now, it could be. Any time that a trial comes upon us, we should examine ourselves and see if we are at fault. Have we been doing what we should be doing spiritually and physically? But yet, on the other hand, any time that God allows a trial upon us, whether it's due to time and chance, it says in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 11, that time and chance happens to every man. So if we're in the wrong place at the wrong time and something happens to us, no matter how the trial or the test comes, remember to turn to God. Another way that God allows us to be tested is he oftentimes delays an answer. In Psalm 13, how long will you forget me, O Eternal? Forever? Are you going to forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? So God does allow oftentimes the trial or the difficulty to go on, the suffering and the pain. But he has a greater purpose in mind. It's not just so that we can suffer. That's not the point at all. But through suffering, we might learn what he wants us to learn. And even though he were a son, Jesus Christ, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And we have been called to suffer as well. Consider and hear me, O eternal my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemies say, I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am removed. So he asks those questions. But notice what he comes back to in verse 5. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your deliverance. I will sing unto the eternal because he has dealt bountifully with me. And that is the attitude or the frame of mind that we should be in and we should hold to even though God may delay an answer. By doubting God during the time of trouble, you're in effect calling him a liar. So don't do this. David had a delay in help, but he trusted in mercy. He waited on God. And you'll find that David, in the Psalms, he'll go through all kind of things, maybe at the beginning of a psalm, of crying out to God and, Have you forsaken me, God? But then there comes the answer, I will remember the days of the Most High. I will look to Him. I will count on His mercy. I know His mercy never fails. And I'll wait for Him. He'll deliver me. I'll rejoice in His salvation. That positive aspect is always there. So, those are seven ways how God allows us to be put to the text. Now, that's not an all-inclusive list by any means, but at least it's seven of the principal ways how. Now, on tests, don't get these confused. That's how God allows us to be tested. By demanding greater sacrifice, by leading us in a difficult way, by giving us the opportunity of choice, by proposing hard tasks which may seem impossible, by permitting us to suffer while doing the work of God, allowing time and chance to come upon us, and delaying an answer. Now, the next thing that we're going to cover with regard to trials, what is the purpose of a trial? As I said before, when Satan tempts, He does it for destruction. He wants to destroy you. God does not tempt, but he does allow trials for the purpose of 
The overall purpose, of course, is to develop his character. But let's break it down into some specific things. The purpose of trials. One, so that we will cease from sin. I'd like for you to turn now to 1 Peter 4, verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. So that we will cease from sin. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. When you begin to suffer in the flesh, when you begin to experience the pains of the way of a man, and you real and you come after self examination through the Word of God and maybe counsel to understand that this was brought on because of sin. And that's why you're suffering. So he says here, He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And there are many aspects to this. One of the greatest sufferings that a person can have brought upon him comes from someone saying something bad about a person and just cutting you to the very quick. And you suffer from that. Of course, there are all the steps that are given in the Bible concerning how to deal with that, which that's not our purpose at the moment. There is a way to go to your brother and deal with that. But yet at the same time, what else should you learn from that? If you suffer that much from someone making cutting remarks about you, what should you determine in your heart? That you would... Never do that yourself, that you would cease from that sin. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So you realize how much a cutting remark hurts you. Then, if you've really learned the lesson of sin, you won't then go perpetrate that same act on someone else. Notice verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Now, there's not always a one-to-one ratio of sin to suffering and suffering to sin. There's not always a one-to-one ratio of sin to suffering and suffering to sin. But sin, ultimately will bring suffering. God doesn't always execute sentence against an evil work speedily, as it says back in Ecclesiastes, but sooner or later, the price is to be paid. And what it says in Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sows of the flesh, he shall out of the flesh reap corruption. If he sows of the Spirit, he shall out of the Spirit reap spiritual things. Another reason or purpose for trial, so that we will learn obedience. We will learn obedience. It's very similar to the first one, he is who has suffered in the flesh and ceased from sin. And it's stated a different way in Hebrews chapter five, verse eight, which I've already referred to with regard to Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 5, verse 8, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, so that we will learn obedience. Christ learned obedience through the things he suffered. A third purpose of trials, so that we will learn to hate evil. Do you really hate the evil that's going on in the world today when you see the fruits of that evil? For anyone who consistently reads the newspaper and listens to at least 30 minutes of CNN a day, 
which I try to read the newspaper a little bit every day, and I listen to CNN, I would imagine, at least 30 minutes a day, you can be thoroughly filled to the brim with the fruits of the way the world is currently going. Let's notice back in Proverbs chapter 8, Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13, what God says concerning evil and how necessary it is, it's a part of the package of wisdom that we'll be discussing a little bit later on, but one of the purposes for allowing trial so that we may come to hate evil. In Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the eternal is to hate evil. And you can't really have wisdom unless you fear God. The fear of the eternal is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. So when you see the fruits of going the way of evil, do you hate it? Do you cry out to God and ask that God would deliver mankind from the evil that is upon them? God wants us to hate the very source of sin. How many people are suffering today because of drugs? How many people are suffering because of alcoholism? How many people are suffering as a result of promiscuity in the sexual sense? Oh, the misery, the agony, the pain. And now we have innocent people being affected. Those three little boys down in Florida uh, who had received blood transfusions and from that contacted the AIDS virus. And the misery and the pain that their family is going through at the present time. They've been, uh, they were allowed to go to the public schools last week and then they were burned out with such a protest in the school and the community over their attendance. And I'm not saying they should or should not have gone to school. That's not the point. The point is the suffering, the misery, the agony, the pain that is extant in the world because of evil. Another purpose of trial, so that we will go on to maturity, to the fullness of Christ, so we might come to be perfect as Jesus Christ is perfect. So it talks about Ephesians 4, in Ephesians 4, 13, 15, that we may grow up to the measure, the fullness, the stature of Jesus Christ. Another purpose of trial, so that we will learn to trust God, rely on Him, Know and believe that He is the Deliverer. Once again, so that we will learn to trust God, rely on Him, know and believe that He is the Deliverer. Let's turn to Psalm 27. Psalm 27 is one of my favorite places in the Bible. Over the years I have spent a great deal of time in Psalm 27. It's been one of my places of refuge. And one of the things that you'll note if you carefully look at the meaning of some of the words in the book of Psalms, that you flee to God for refuge. And His Word, of course, is the place to flee. Jesus Christ is that rock. Jesus Christ is the living Word. You flee to his word, to that rock, Jesus Christ, who will give you the comfort and what you need in time of trouble, so that we will learn to trust God, rely on him, know and believe that he is the deliverer. To put our very life, our faith, our confidence in God, he'll take care of us. So note Psalm 27. This oftentimes is sung for special music. The Lord is the light of my life. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
When the wicked, even mine enemies and mine foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Eternal, that that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Eternal all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Eternal and to inquire in His temple." Of course, today the church of God is that temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Verse 10, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the eternal will take me up. And then in verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the eternal in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the eternal. So that we might learn to trust him and to believe him. And very closely related to that is to learn the providence of God. Number six, purpose of trial to learn the providence of God. This is one of the greatest concepts that a person could possibly internalize and inculcate into their lives. This is one of the other concepts that keeps me going. The providence of God means this. God has our best interest at heart. Whatever happens to us in which God's hand is involved... God has our best interest at heart. And even those things that happen to us that are not of God, if we'll turn to God and trust Him and seek Him and follow Him in working through that that trial that God wasn't responsible for, even that can be turned into something good in the ultimate sense. The providence of God. He has our best interest at heart. Let's notice back in Genesis chapter 45, one of the most striking examples of this, one of the most powerful that I know of in the entire Bible, the providence of God. God is looking out for us years in advance. You ever thought about that? God looking out for us years in advance. And as I reflect back over my life, and I see various critical turns in my life, and I begin to wonder whether or not God's hand was not in that, and that he had in mind, and I believe he did, he says, those whom he predestinated to be called at this time, these he foreknew. And that there was the providence of God at work in my life, in your life, back in an earlier time. might have been with your parents as far as actually coming into the church and into the congregation of God. But then he's looking out for your best interest years in advance. I know my heart's desire when I was a boy was to play Major League Baseball. And after graduating from high school, I signed a contract with the Chicago Cubs and started playing minor league baseball. I was playing alongside Billy Williams. Billy Williams was inducted into the Hall of Fame uh, this past autumn. Billy Williams and I are almost the same age. He grew up in Mobile, Alabama. I grew up in Laurel, Mississippi, about 90 miles apart. As far as just raw talent and ability, I had surely as much as he had, and I could hit the ball with more power. But for some reason, I did not make it in the same way that he did. Now, I I could say, oh, well, it was just time and chance, and maybe it could have been, maybe it was. But yet at the same time, I believe that God had something else in mind. 
I could recount many, many other stories. The providence of God. When I was in college, my senior year in college, first time around, way before I came to Ambassador, this was in a university outside. Our oldest daughter, age 18 months, was in baby bed, and I was babysitting. My All through college, my wife worked, and I was on an athletic scholarship, but as far as the actual money we had, athletic scholarship pays for room, board, and tuition. But then you have to have other things if you're married and going to college. So she worked from 4 o'clock in the afternoon to 12 o'clock at night. So I kept, uh, after football practice, I kept our, our daughter. So it was about 10 o'clock at night. She was in the baby bed, and she was really happy and jumping up and down. And I passed by, and she made a lunge out for me, and she just came over the side of the baby bed and came down. The first thing it hit was her forehead here. And it was uh, an oak floor with no rug on it, just solid oak floor. And so she cried a little bit, and... We, uh, really, literally, it was a little bit. She didn't cry all that much. And there was a little spot here, about that big around. And so we played around a bit. She seemed to be all right, and I put her to bed. And then my wife came home a little bit after 12, and I told her about it, and I said we should go check on her. So we went over the end there, and she had vomited. She was burning up with a fever, and her heart was racing, you know, who knows, 125, 30 beats a minute. And so we got ready as quickly as we could and took her to the emergency room. We got to the emergency room, and the doctor got there fairly quickly for that time of night. He began to do the various neurological tests. There was just practically no response, and by now she had gone into convulsions. And after a little bit more of testing, he'd stick pins in the bottom of her foot, no response, bite in the eyes, no response. He said, you know, she's got one chance, if she has any chance of living, and that is to have this pressure on the brain relieved immediately. And you can either go to Memphis Tennessee, or you can go to Jackson, Mississippi. We were about halfway in between. And uh, I said, I think we'll go to Jackson. And um, they called the ambulance as quickly as they could. They loaded her up. And my wife got on the ambulance with her because I was going to drive our car on down. As they were pulling out, He said, the doctor turned to me and said, she has one chance out of a million of even living to Jackson, Mississippi. It's about 140 miles. And so I said, well, if she dies, we'll just go ahead and have the funeral at my home. So I'm going to go back and get all of our clothes so we don't have to come back here. So I went back to the apartment, got our clothes, and then went after that ambulance, which I could never catch. But all the way, praying, you know, and making a lot of ridiculous promises in a way, if you'll let her live, even if she's uh, sort of retarded, I'll I'll do whatever uh, to help her the rest of my life. So I drove that two and a half hours in that frame of mind thinking that she would die and then I by the time I got there it was day. the day was just breaking and I burst into that emergency room and some nurse was there and it's usually you wouldn't be able to find anyone who knew anything that quickly and she told me immediately she says are you the father of the little girl that was brought in here and I said yes she said She's all right. She's fine. And I went up there, and she was all right. She was fine. And by the later on that day, she was playing all over the room. So I talked with my wife, and she said that by the time that they had gotten 50 miles down the road, 
that the pressure was gone. Just, you could tell that she was back to normal. So did God hear my prayer and answer, intervene at that time to show me something? You could say, oh, well, just time and chance, so the pressure went away. Well, I tend to believe otherwise. So I do believe that God, of course, his providence, and he has a powerful, powerful, powerful influence in our lives, past, present, and future. Now, we don't have time then to go fully into this account here, but we'll start it in Genesis chapter 45, the story where Joseph was sold into captivity by his brothers, eventually winding up in the court of Pharaoh and one of the leading men in Pharaoh's government, perhaps a second in command over the, over the Egyptians. The famine came upon the land where Joseph's family lived, and Jacob had sent Joseph's brothers down in Egypt to buy grain. And so that's where we find ourselves in Genesis 45. And Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. There stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled in his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that you sold me here. For God did send me before you to preserve life a providence of God. You see, if God is working in your life, no one can lay hand on you. No one can harm a hair of your head. He'll take care of you. He won't allow you to be sold into slavery unless he has a purpose or a plan that he's working out greater. And remember all the things, how he allows us to be tried, purpose of trials, now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me here, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years has the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me here. You're not that big, brothers. See, God had a hand in it. He knew what he was doing. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and the lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. You see, Joseph had come to the point where he had internalized Romans 8.28, and so must we. All things work together, together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Okay, we'll see you next time. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.